As I've mentioned, by the early 1980s, the leadership of the Soviet Union recognized a growing crisis in Soviet society, slowing rates of economic growth, which undermined this very critical uh, implied social contract to provide people with a decent life and an improving uh, life. And no less important, deep and widespread alienation from the very fundamental values uh, of the system itself. In March 1985, Mikhail Gorbachev was made head of the party, general secretary of the Communist Party, with a mandate to address this crisis. And his first step was simply to admit that it existed at all, to admit it publicly. For the first time, in fact, government uh, and party leaders were encouraged to talk openly uh, and honestly about economic problems in the country, to admit that economic growth was slowing, to admit that it had terrible effects on people's standard uh, of living. In fact, people began officially to talk about stagnation in the economy, a, a t what soon became a sort of key term for describing the Brezhnev years. But they also admitted a fundamental cultural uh, ideological uh, crisis. Uh, Gorbachev began immediately to speak openly from the platform of head of party about many of the phenomena that we've been talking about. Withdrawal from public life into private life. Widespread problems of alcoholism and even rising drug addiction. Pessimism, uh, cynicism, especially among uh, the youth. Weakened respect for work was a phrase he often uh, used. In other words, a spiritual crisis, a crisis of belief and values. And his solutions to this crisis were, was two-pronged. First of all, political and economic reform, restructuring as it was called, using the Russian word perestroika. This meant, for example, encouraging in industry greater responsibility among managers of various industrial enterprises to ensure uh, economic efficiency. Simply put, if they couldn't make a profit, couldn't balance uh, income and uh, costs, they would simply have to close their factories. It also meant in the political sphere allowing multi-candidate elections to local office. This was in 1987 where candidates were encouraged to compete and debate issues so people could choose who would be better. In 1988, this was uh, extended even further by creating a new body, a Congress of People's Deputies, elected uh, in the course of national elections uh, with multiple candidates uh, for every seat. The goal, of course, was to re-involve citizens in public life, uh, to feel that the government was connected to them, that it was theirs in many ways. The second prong of this reform to address this looming uh, crisis was what, is be what became known quickly as a policy of glasnost, using uh, the Russian word. This meant a policy of greater openness, of greater honesty, of greater discussion about the actual problems of public life. This included honesty about the past. Especially this meant honesty about Stalinism. Uh, in recent years, uh, under late Brezhnev and in the rules uh, the, during the rulers following him, uh, the tendency was to discourage people from remembering the bad things that happened under Stalin. Now this changed dramatically, and indeed even other periods could be talked about, even occasionally uh, the rule uh, of Lenin. Press, uh, television especially, was now filled with roundtables and discussions about the communist past, more open and more honest than anything ever heard before, even under Khrushchev. And honesty about the present was also part of what glasnost meant. Uh, a poster that appeared in 1987 was rather typical. A picture pictured on this, on this poster, which was widely distributed in the country, was nothing more complex than rose-colored glasses having been discarded, lying uh, as if taken off. And beneath it were written the words, let's take a realistic look at things. Given decades of lies and self-deceptions about the real conditions of Soviet life, these rather simple words, if sincere, and people assumed that they were, uh, were a bold uh, and radical declaration. We know, of course, what actually happened as a result of Gorbachev's efforts. His reforms uh, encouraged a loosening of bonds 
throughout the system. Uh, within the Soviet Union, people began indeed to speak openly about the problems and openly about solutions, about the need in particular for a more democratic, a truly market-oriented uh, system, not just modest reforms in managerial responsibility. In Eastern Europe, where Gorbachev also encouraged reforms and where discontent with the system was in many ways even higher, it led to a wave of popular revolutions that swept communists out of power in 1989. In 1990 and 1991, the Baltic states in Georgia, where discontent was also high with its, with, uh, its subjugation, uh, the subjugation of these states to the Soviet Union, here these states demanded total independence in order to go their own way. And even in Russia itself, the Russian Federation, the center and core of the Soviet Union, a radical reformer, a man who continued to criticize Gorbachev as going too slow, Boris uh, Yeltsin, was elected president of Russia. Now, conservative communists, convinced that Gorbachev was to blame for all this disintegration of the system uh, in Russia and abroad, uh, decided the time had come to act. They, in August of 1991, uh, arrested uh, Gorbachev and seized power, what became known as the Putsch. Resistance to this coup, uh, which included dramatic moments of Boris Yeltsin standing on a tank a swearing defiance against the conservative communists led to its failure uh, within a matter of days. And in the wake of this coup against Gorbachev and his reforms, the Russian government, led by Yeltsin, banned the Communist Party in all of Russia, joined other republics that were at that moment quitting the USSR altogether, leaving the Soviet Union nothing but an empty shell uh, which would be abolished in December of that year. In fact, on Christmas Day of 1991, uh, Gorbachev, now essentially president of a country that existed only on paper, a country that existed in, as it were, virtual, not physical space, uh, recognized the inevitable and resigned uh, as head of the USSR. This is a dramatic story, an important story for the world, but no less uh, fascinating is the story of the man who stood at its very center, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev. Uh, himself. And what this lecture tries to do is understand this man, what he was trying to accomplish, what ideas motivated him, and also why he failed uh, by looking closely at his values and his ideas. Uh, my source, I should say, say for this, are his own writings, uh, his own speeches, uh, which are plentiful with indications of where he was going even before he came to power and then certainly after he became uh, head of the party and then government uh, after 85. First of all, to understand Gorbachev, it's necessary to understand his historical type. He is, he was, and indeed in many ways still is, a characteristic true believer. Now, Every society, of course, has its own official version of itself, what might be called its sustaining uh, myth. These are the ideals by which a country defines itself. In the United States, for example, it's democracy and individual freedom and equal opportunity. This is our official version of what we stand for. The USSR had also an official version of itself, that it was the most democratic country in the world, the most just, the most humanistic, the most economically dynamic. Also, in every society, there's a certain discrepancy between these sustaining mythic ideals, these, this uh, ideal about what the society should stand for, and real everyday practices between ideal and reality. Needless to say, in the Soviet Union, this gap between ideals and reality was a yawning chasm. However, also in every society, there are people who find these ideals so powerfully meaningful, they can't tolerate any hypocrisy. They can't tolerate duplicity. Gorbachev, and many of the people who were associated with him in his reforms, was just such a person, a true uh, believer. He took his country's official values, especially what it said about socialism and what it should mean, so seriously he wished them to be real. And this true belief was his source of both his reforming zeal, but also in many ways it was part of the reason he was unwilling to let reform go too far in order to undermine the socialism he truly believed in and was trying to make more uh, vital.
Of course, one has to understand how Gorbachev understood this official socialist tradition. And to do this, I want to focus on three key ideas that were extremely important uh, for him and pervade his public statements. His ideas about democracy, about state power, and about moral order. Now, as you know, it's long been the official claim of the Soviet system that it is more democratic, was more democratic than any other, that the people rule, that socialism had produced a truer democracy than parliamentary democracy in the West, which, given capitalism, meant that actually, they used to say, the rich really uh, ruled, not in the Soviet Union, where true democracy uh, ruled. Gorbachev was the first Soviet leader, at least since the 1920s, to admit that the practices of Soviet socialism were far from democratic, much less expressing a higher democracy. But he wanted this dream uh, to come true. He took this myth seriously. One sees this in his speeches uh, before 1985 and afterwards. They're filled with talk about the democratic nature of socialism, though to be sure everybody was saying this, everybody officially, but we also see constant appeals for people to become more involved, to take more initiative. Indeed, this was the whole purpose of perestroika, of multi-candidate uh, elections, the whole purpose behind glasness, to make this democratic ideal real. However, when Gorbachev talked about democracy, and he talked a lot about democracy, and when he talked about popular participation as at its core, he used these ideas in particular ways, in a distinctive manner. For Gorbachev, it's clear, real democracy meant orderly and responsible participation by the public uh, in government, in public life. And for years, he lectured people about just this importance of order and responsibility. Uh, starting in the 1970s, when he was party chief for the Stavropol uh, region in southwest uh, Russia, at the foot of the Caucasus, mountains. Starting in this period, his speeches were filled with arguments about the need to ground freedom in what he called civic responsibility, one of his favorite phrases. The need to link, link rights with responsibilities, to make criticism constructive, to pervert, preserve law and order, a favorite phrase of his. In January 1987, when he was general secretary, he similarly told uh, made these same arguments in a speech before the Central Committee of the Communist Party. Socialist democracy, he said, and this is what he was trying to promote, socialist democracy is the organic combination of democracy and discipline, of independence and responsibility, of rights and duties. Socialist democracy has nothing, he says, in common with permissiveness, irresponsibility, and anarchy. Similarly, during his very last year in power, in 1991, this appeal for reason and order and responsibility became especially pervasive. And one can hear it in his attacks, for example, on Boris Yeltsin, who he said was too impatient, too extreme, too irrational, not sufficiently sober, by which he meant both in politics and, of course, in his own personal life. One can hear it in his criticisms of people he began to call so-called Democrats, who talked about freedom but didn't remember about discipline and responsibility. One hears it also in his attack on right-wing nationalists, a movement that was growing uh, during the Gorbachev years. He complained they're too irrational, they're too emotional, they're too nostalgic. One needs rational and ordered democracy. Now, partly, these sort of attitudes are not surprising uh, in a man in his position. One can argue that this was about uh, ideas about how he held power while trying to involve people in public life, how he kept control of the process of change. But there's more to this, I think, than just the logic of power uh, itself. Partly, these were pragmatic considerations. For example, he told a group of Belarusian intellectuals in March of 1991, the shelves cannot be filled without establishing order and legality in the country, without stabilization. But these arguments about disciplined, responsible democracy also reflected how he thought about power itself, about authority, about the very nature of the state and its uses. Like Lenin, his great hero, uh, like also earlier reforming rulers in Russian history, so here in a way we come back full circle to Peter the Great and his successors, 
Gorbachev believed in the necessity of strong central authority in times of change. Throughout his career, Gorbachev frequently spoke about the important role the party played in Soviet history and Soviet life. Even when it was no longer necessary to make this a claim, he continued to argue the party played a positive role. After, for example, perestroika was already underway, and after 1987, he continued to insist on the need for a strong political party that would be able, in his words, to unite all the healthy forces of the people to accomplish the historic task of renewing socialism. By early 1991, as he found the Communist Party and its members, especially its leaders, proving increasingly rigid and resistant to change, he began to shift attention away from the party toward the state and toward his own newly elected position as president, as head of state, elected by the new parliament in 1990, rather than to his role as head of the party. But the essential argument remained the same. Without strong central power, he said again and again and again, there can be no progress in Russia, in the Soviet Union. There can be no change. He insisted this is one of the laws of history, a phrase he often used. Or again, his words, such transitions have always required strong power. You'll, of course, recognize echoes of dozens of similar statements throughout Russian history, uh, as we've seen uh, in this course. Indeed, one of the persistent ideals in the history of the Russian state is this notion of the civilizing role of force exerted from above, as one scholar put it, writing about the 18th and 19th centuries. Uh, one sees it in the same sort of dialectics of power and progress being interconnected and interdependent as we saw in the 18th and 19th century. We see it with Gorbachev, too. Now, there's a second component uh, to all of this, uh, as often before. Not just strong power was needed in times of change, but it should be civilized power, conscious uh, power. In other words, it's about the qualities uh, of leaders, what makes power into effective authority. Throughout his career, uh, and reflecting these ideals of state power as progressive leadership, Gorbachev was obsessed with the qualities uh, of leadership, with the nature, one might say, of this vanguard, this power that's going to bring about change, lead change. Already before he came to central power, uh, Gorbachev began criticizing the inadequacies of leadership in the Soviet Union, though at this early stage focusing on the inadequacies of local leaders. In 1975, for example, when he was party leader in Stavropol province, first secretary technically was his title, he criticized leaders that he saw around him who offered only, in his words, beautiful words but no practical deeds who held offices but were completely incompetent in the area of responsibility they were given, who liked to boss people around but not work efficiently with people uh, to get things done, who were simply bad managers. By the early 1980s, as Gorbachev's own power uh, grew in 1980, in fact, he became a member of the Politburo. And one of the reasons he rose to power was indeed partly because of his own reputation as a good manager, as a competent uh, leader, by this period, his critique of leadership became even more encompassing. For example, in a speech he made in 1983, he chastised many officials throughout the country for a variety of characteristic failings. Formalism, he called it, words not matched by action. Procrastination, he used a great Russian word here, uh, volakita, which sometimes is translated as red tape. Inertia sluggishness, self-satisfaction. These are his, his words. After he came to central power, after he became general secretary in 1985, he launched a major campaign against these evils of poor leadership. And in opposition to these evils, he launched a campaign in favor of the virtues of good authority. For example, again, his vocabulary. Practical action, not just words. Business-like behavior. Goal orientation, effectiveness, responsibility, competence, honesty. These were the ideals he constantly talked about that Soviet leaders should have in order to make this transition happen. As you can probably notice, though, these ideas about democracy, these ideas about power that Gorbachev had, were pervaded with a rather striking moralism. 
the need for responsibility and self-discipline in democracy, the need for honesty and true commitment and ability uh, in uh, leadership. In fact, there is even a more sweeping moral vision than this in Gorbachev's uh, ideas and the inspiration behind uh, his actions and his talk about reform. He was, in fact, since the mid-1970s, constantly preaching a high moral code to anybody who would listen to him. While he was party leader in the Stavropol region, he frequently called on people, for example, to, his words, struggle against violations of labor discipline, acquisitiveness, theft, bribe-taking, and drunkenness, all real problems in Soviet life, afflicting even the leadership. In the early 1980s, when he became Politburo member, he again intensified this preaching to the whole nation uh, to live a more moral life. He demanded greater intolerance of, again, to use his words, indiscipline, social passivity, parasitism, moral nihilism. And he suggested that practically that various social organizations in Russian life, especially those working with young people, uh, help people spend their leisure hours in improving activities, sporting events, amateur artistic festivals he tried to organize, uh, singing competitions on television, art exhibitions, things to raise people's moral level. And once he became general secretary, uh, and after 1988, head of state, president as well, this sort of moral preaching, one might describe it as puritanical moral preaching, reached a real fever uh, pitch. Uh, among his first acts on coming to power was a campaign for sobriety, to end drunkenness, which was such a problem, so widespread, uh, especially among Soviet men. Similarly, he launched a major campaign for work uh, discipline, to encourage people to come to work on time and to work hard uh, while there. Later, equally unsuccessfully, I should say, as these first two campaigns, he launched a major campaign against pornography, which was illegally available throughout the Soviet Union, and against prostitution, which also was illegally, increasingly widespread. He also launched a campaign against what he called Western mass culture, the culture of pop, the popularity of Western rock music, uh, of genes, of Western style of individualism, the spread of drugs, of styles of dress, and the like. In general, he's constantly in these years preaching to the nation about uh, morality, about a whole list of sins that he noticed wherever he looked. Passivity, his words again, irresponsibility, arrogance, boorishness, consumerism, materialism, and even Philistine vulgarity, using a great Russian word, poshlist, with a long tradition of something the intelligentsia in Russia in the 19th century also hated. By the way, it's telling that in this light that Gorbachev's first uses of the now famous word perestroika, this was in the early 18, 1980s, before he came to power, referred not to structural changes in politics or in the economy, but what he liked to call perestroika reconstruction of the mind, psychological perestroika, perestroika of consciousness, even perestroika of spiritual life. This is how he first used this term. What are we to make of all this moral uh, preaching? Partly, of course, there are practical uh, considerations. His awareness of the social and economic costs of moral uh, indiscipline. This is especially evident in his current concern with drunkenness among workers. It's uh, part of his need for effective leaders, sober, responsible, honest leaders. It's also uh, part of his concern with abuses of democracy by citizens. This was all can be seen as quite practical. But there's more, I think, than pragmatism involved here. I'd even say that for Gorbachev, ethics and morality went to the heart of his ideals about socialism, why he believed in socialism, why he believed that actual socialism needed a major overhaul. His speeches and writings in these years are filled with talk about socialism as humanism about socialism as leading to the fullest development of the human person. And indeed, he uses that old intelligentsia term, leechness, the human personality out of which comes a natural dignity which should, a society should recognize. He thought socialism could do this best, that it could best promote human dignity, that it could best promote what he called universal human values.
As you can notice, by the way, these, may also, these are also in some ways the ideas that pervaded the alternative political culture in the years before and during uh, Gorbachev. The sort of ideas that were widespread among the educated in the 1960s and 70s, including uh, dissenters, though of course with roots much older uh, in Russian history. Where Gorbachev differed from this alternative culture, from many of his contemporaries in fact, educated contemporaries, is that he believed that these ideas, these values, were about socialism and could be used to revitalize socialism, to make it truly work. Which brings us to the question of why he failed. Why he failed to create a viable humanistic socialist society of which he dreamed. In part the failure is simply practical. The economy, despite all his efforts, remained stagnant, partly, many say, because he feared pushing economic reforms too fast that might undermine uh, socialism, but also old problems that were simply difficult to eradicate uh, with any of the measures he adopted. Most of all, though, one might suggest, he failed because too few people shared his vision of socialism. Communists, for example, tradition-minded communists, viewed his ideas as undermining communism as undermining the power and order of the system that was to them uh, critical. This is why in August of 1991 they tried to overthrow him. Though of course, as you know, the real result was really only to hammer the final nails into the coffin of the old communist order. More liberal-minded citizens also lacked his attachment to these ideas of socialism. They felt that the ideals about human dignity and rights and humanism pointed not to socialism, but to a free market economy and to a truly liberal democratic society without a role of a communist party uh, at all. And many of these people were in fact determined to see more radical change than Gorbachev uh, believed in or believed uh, was safe. Their time, of course, would come uh, when the coup against Gorbachev failed, when the communist party was banned throughout Russia, which was now independent, and when the USSR collapsed. The problem, as many discovered, is that freedom, which was gained in 1991, even truly democratic elections with multiple parties uh, competing, truly free uh, markets, a completely free press, freedom answers only some of people's desires and needs, the desires and needs that led them to be discontented uh, with the Soviet Union. People also need, Russians certainly want, security uh, in their lives, personal security, but especially material. They want their government to be effective and honest. They want to be proud uh, of their country, have it respected uh, in, the in the world. And the dramatic collapse of communism in 1991 did not immediately or still solve these problems. On the contrary, while freedom truly flourished after 1991 in almost every conceivable way, the social order disintegrated. The economy declined precipitously. A 40% drop uh, in the gross domestic product, the GDP, in only eight years from early 1992 uh, to early 2000. Almost half of the economy vanished. And only in the last couple of years is growth beginning. Growing wealth in the society besides widespread uh, poverty. 30 to 50 percent of the people in post-communist Russia are still beneath the poverty line. One sees widespread homelessness and begging side by side with a class known as New Russians with fancy apartments and independent houses and Mercedes and foreign clothes and Western bank accounts. We see disastrous public health conditions, most visibly in the dramatic drop in the age of death uh, in Russia, which now is still only in, in the 50s for men. Widespread crime, both organized crime associated with the famous uh, mafia, basically protection rackets, but also a great deal of disorganized crime, muggings and burglary, uh, and even widespread murder. We see, since the end of communism and the coming of freedom, widespread moral breakdown, rising prostitution, increasing drunkenness, growing gambling, drug use, and a heightened wave of suicides. And one sees uh, and saw in the first in the years after the end of communism widespread corruption in business uh, as it became privatized and even uh, in government. 
though Putin, Vladimir Putin's coming to power uh, in the last couple of years, uh, in, beginning with 2000, has led to a decline at least of government corruption. To be sure, conditions have begun to improve in many ways in the last few years. More manufacture of Russian goods, a parliamentary system that is working tolerably uh, well, a growing body of laws that are protecting individuals and institutions, uh, and the continuing development of civil society, political parties, a free press, various civic organizations. And yet, most Russians are still far from living the life they most crave, what most Russians will simply call a normal life. So many social problems still remain. And yet, the majority of people in Russia are today quite patient. They've had their fill of revolutions, of utopian radical uh, experiments, and indeed there are slow, gradual signs of change. And perhaps, one might suggest, this time they'll win. And the sort of life that generations of Russians, many of whom we've looked at in this course, the sort of life they've dreamed of and tried so hard to create, a life that is free and democratic and prosperous and ethical, in which the individual really can live with the dignity uh, he deserves, she deserves as a human being, that this sort of life will finally be theirs.